I know the human being and fish can coexist peacefully. With the price of gold up as high as it is right now, a lot of people are trying to supplement their income. Uh, people are actually trying to make money at it. I don't make any money doing this. Doesn't even cover gas. No money, you got a calculator? Calculate this, $1,429 divided by 31.5. What'd you get? Almost $50, right? That's a paycheck where I spend and buy equipment, food, supplies, gas, this, that, which in, in turn puts into the comedy. There are probably some people that hike up in there that uh, is a major part of their income or maybe all of it. For the most part, the people that go up there, it's an activity that they participate in on weekends. It almost pays the bills, basically like making a living. All right, well, my name is Jerry Hobbs. I got into mining because I was an avid fisherman. And I was on the Kern River back in 1979. And I saw a man digging potholes out. And I watched him and he asked me if I'd like to try it. And I tried it and I got a little bit of gold and I've done a lot less fishing since then and a lot more prospecting. I used to come up here camping and fishing and hiking and all that when I was a kid. Never knew nothing about no gold. Well, I met Bernie one day. Yeah, my name's Bernie McGrath, and I've been a prospector here in the San Gabriel River. I've been doing it for about 23 years. One day I was fishing, and I run into a man that was banging on the rocks, and I asked him, hey man, what are you doing? And he said, I'm looking for gold. I went over to him and he showed me what he was doing and he showed me the amount of gold he got. And next morning, I went to the same spot, and I did the same as he showed me. And by God, I got the same amount of gold, covered the bottom of the bottle. And I go, wow, if I'd done that every day, I wouldn't be long before I filled that bottle. My name's Kevin, and uh, I've been prospecting here since right after the 2005 flood. Sometimes it, it supplements my income. So I didn't find much my first couple times, but it was rewarding. Just to find one little speck of, of gold was, was really cool. And all of a sudden I see the rocks move, and then next thing I see it was a bunch of black sand there. He goes, now keep on doing that. And he goes, if there's something in there, it'll show you. And I kept on doing it, and, it and all of a sudden, bam. Boop, boop, three about oatmeal sized flakes sitting right there in the back there. I was hooked. <laughs> the, the beauty to me of prospecting is you're not killing anything. You're not even, you know, catch and release, you're not even putting a hook in that animal, you know. As a prospector now, I, I see fish in the river and they're like my friends. My name is Jonathan Baskin. I'm Emeritus Professor of Biological Sciences at Cal Poly University of Pomona. I got my PhD at the City University of New York. I've been at Pomona since 1971. And since that time, I've been working on the Santa Ana Sucker and the Unarmored Three Spine Stickleback. The Santa Ana Sucker was listed in around 96 or somewhere near. Quite a few years ago, uh, it got on the endangered species list. One of the important things about trying to save the sucker is there are very few native Southern California freshwater fishes. And once we start letting things go, you never know telling where, where an ecosystem will fall apart. 
That's a big question whenever you deal with endangered species. The exotic species we find up in the San Gabriel River are not well adapted for, the, uh, for that part of the river and could become extinct themselves and then we'd be left with nothing. If the Santa Ana sucker was the most prolific in the East Fork of the San Gabriel River and pretty much extinct in all the other rivers, and the only river out of all of them that suction dredge mined is the East Fork, that the Santa Ana suckers is there because of the suction dredge is conducive to their habitat, not in spite of it. To me, that makes sense. A suction dredge is basically a device that is floating in the stream and it has a gasoline engine and with a water pump and with the water going into the pump and exiting the pump that water shoots into what's called a venturi. The venturi is a, a larger diameter tube that has a vacuum line hooked up to it so it passes the material through the venturi, it vacuums it up from the bottom of the river stream and it pushes it through a sluice box. And as you work upstream, that gravel falls right back in. And in most cases, it fills the actual holes. But we also know that the sucker fish thrive when dredging is going. We see hundreds of frogs, hundreds of fish, hundreds, if not thousands, of salamanders. You know what a salamander is? You know, doot, 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 in the water. Yeah, they're cool. Through a lot of the different studies have shown that suction dredging is actually beneficial to the environment. A lot of the base of the river has a tendency to, to silt up. But when the dredgers get in there and they actually create pools, what it does is it creates new spawning grounds for them. Santa Ana sucker is a fish that lays its eggs in the gravel. Disturbing the gravel like that, especially during the breeding season, would be very detrimental to the sucker. So that's why they're concerned about the gold mining. Sucker feeds on algae on the surface of rocks, and uh, the entire surface of these rocks, if left undisturbed, will become covered with a layer of algae that is the, the staple food for the Santa Ana sucker. And in order for that algae to develop, you have to lay, let the let the rocks on the bottom stay in place. So if you're constantly going in and disturbing the bottom and dredging up all the rocks, then you're messing up that development of the algae food source for the sucker. And the Santa Ana sucker fish would actually feed inches from my from my suction nozzle. And where there's no dredging elsewhere in other streams, they die. Yeah, I don't think we can attribute the, the fact that the suckers are doing well in this East Fork to, to mining. I mean, there are natural processes going on there. The river, is, the river runs well and there's good, good water quality. So I think that the uh, natural processes are taking over there. So really, everything is propaganda, really and they uh, bullshitting the, the public. I'm gonna tell you now, these environmental people are not out there trying to save anything. They're trying, it's all about money. Well, what we do to protect that environment is to leave it alone. It's just something that they can use for leverage to try to get these people out of there. Ranges have uh, rules and regulations that they try to apply. That isn't the issue. The issue is homeless. There is a problem with people up there who are homeless. They probably have a gold pan or a sluice box and they're trying to eke out a penny or two here, there. The problem is the forest laws don't allow somebody to stay more than a a determined time for the district ranger. It could be two weeks up to 30 days. Uh, I, I think that that's kind of what they're trying to get at, especially when the economy went sour, uh, was that they were trying to nip it in the bud before every homeless person in Southern California went to the hills and could live basically, you know, not easy, but free. I mean, look at my hands. I mean, my hands are cracked, split, everything for the water. So it's not that we're sitting here not doing nothing. So I say for someone who's down and out, they're better off up here. They're not going to cause crimes. They're not going to have a, access to alcohol and drugs. You, have, you, you pretty much have to become a, a clean lifestyle to live up here. I guess I've got compassion for them. You know, I think they're better off living there in the forest than they are down on Fifth and Main Street in downtown LA in a box. Uh, yes, it's unsightly. Some of those people may not be mentally capable of making it in society. They group the two 
together homelessness and prospecting. They've been going along the lower river lately saying they just won a case and that that case allows them to stop everyone from prospecting. Well, the case, as far as I know, was on habitation, legal habitation. The forestry got funny. That's all I can say, funny. We had their backs one time, you know, we always had their backs. We always looked out for them. But now it seems like they're on us, big time. Like we're the bad guys now. A day or two before Christmas on 1990, I took a group of miners, prospectors, up to the East Fork, and we picked up trash and bagged it, hundreds of pounds of it. Go see the bear says, pack it in, pack it out. Right? Hooty hoo out the owl, hooty hoo hoo. I used to bug them for trash bags. Hey, let me get the trash bag. At least I can pass them out, tell them, hey, if you don't want to haul your trash up to the trash can, here's a bag, put it in, I'll come and pick it up. We just did this out of our goodness, you know. So I said, well, sure, what I'll do is I'll go to the, all the prospecting and mining clubs and I'll see if I can get them to donate a day or two. Maybe we can set it up so they'll clean it once a month. Well, that'd be great. I got notice from the Forest Service that they were stopping all prospecting and throwing the miners out. So I went over there and I said to them, what's the deal? Well, they're not supposed to be in there, the 28 Watershed Act. We don't like them in there anyway. They're doing this, they're doing that. I said, these are the very people that are gonna be cleaning your canyon up. They said, well, they should want the canyon clean whether they get to use it or not. I found that offensive. So I said to him, well, all the exercise and energy that I was gonna put into helping you folks keep that canyon clean, I'm now gonna put into fighting it. And I went to Pat Keene. I told Pat what I wanted to do, and we started building it. These uh, rangers have been going up and telling people that it's illegal to pan for gold, that it's illegal to use a small little sluice box, and uh, the rangers have been going up and down that canyon telling them that their activities are illegal and if they don't stop, they'll be arrested. Uh, this is an editorial cartoon I did of uh, forestry being heavy handed on us as a miner. Uh, I exaggerated a little bit. Some of the stuff that you see in the picture has happened. They do roll up on us. They do confiscate our mining gear. They do issue us citations. They do pull guns on us. They do stick machine guns in tents. We're Smokey the Bear chasing somebody out with a shovel. Just today, there were four officers up here with uh, automatic uh, rifles. Now, that to me seems like a war zone that you're entering. I have a, I have a right to prospect. And, and if, if they think it's like we're just kicking back, not doing nothing, I'd invite any of the forestry guys to come side by side with me and see how they feel at the end of the day. But when these people ask what the law is, the Forest Service can't give them an answer or a definition of the law, which would give them the right to cite these people. There has been numerous cases up there where these rangers are going up there, and when they go talk to the people, they're not just walking up to the front of them. They seem to circle these people and, and kind of intimidate people. And when you're being asked by anyone of authority and you're being circled or the guy has his hand on his gun, you know, that's a reason to be intimidated. It's even hard to come up with answers or talk to them. That just doesn't really seem like uh, good tactics. There's an old miner just kicking back here with a shovel, sluice box, tent, doesn't even know what's going on. And obviously the ranger's writing him a ticket. I've got no compassion for the Forest Service or anything that they do anymore. I tried to help them in the beginning, and I've tried to work with them, and now, They've exceeded all expectations of being ignorant bureaucrats. These forest rangers should be our friend. And rangers, when I was a kid, were out there to help you, not to not to bust you, not to police you, not to, you know, hoard you in the one little area. 
You know, to, to tell a prospector that he can't prospect anymore by law is sort of a, a killing of part of America. It's, it's the state's history, it's the country's history, and if it's taken away from us, it's just a little bit more, one more piece of America that's being taken away, basically.